The song has a lot to say about you too, right? Yeah, I, I started the song. Hello, Tom. How are Hello, you? Hello. Long time. How yeah, are you? Right. Great. All right. Yeah, uh, I had the, the bit about I'm the greatest around, you know, and, the, and the, the little piano lick for quite a bit. And I was always thinking, I can't, I can't sing that. I can't sing that. I'm going to say, you know, it's him singing. He's the greatest. And then I, I kept trying to think, oh, I'll change it. I'll change it. And I thought, I could never change it, you know. And then I thought, oh, Ringo, Ringo, you know. So I finished it off. I sort of wrote it for him, but it was really me, him, all of it. You've been real busy lately, right? You've been working on, what, two albums? Yeah, well, uh, I was in the middle of uh, Phil Spector album, and it was 73, actually. And then Phil was ill or had a car accident. And I waited and waited, you know. And uh, he, he, didn't get, <coughs> he didn't get better like, so <laughs> I decided to go in and start my own album. And three days before it, I went in and booked the time, I suddenly, he sent me the tapes. So from doing nothing for months on end, you know, and just hanging out, suddenly I had all this work to do, which I liked. So I went in and did my own album, which I brought with me, of course. And wait, and Phil Spector is waiting, because he has a different concept of time than the rest of the world. Yeah, he still thinks we're working on the last album, so I finished <laughs> one while we, were, while we were waiting, and uh, I'll go back and deal with Phil's tape, see what we did. Right. Know. And then well, you've done the Nielsen album recently. Oh, yeah, yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pussycats, Pussycats. Yeah, I did that while I was waiting for Phil. And I just sort of got turned on to not being the singer again and being behind the board. So I thought, oh, I may as well do my own now. So I went straight from Harry's into my own. Used basically the same musicians, too. Doesn't sound like you've been loafing very much, though. No, I'm, it's all or nothing with me. All right. OK, um, let's just start through the new album. With uh, right, side one, cut one. That's where they always put the, the, the song they like the most in. Oh, do you? Well, what, what, what do you do? How do you figure out? Uh, it depends, you know. I try and start it off with, except for when I did Imagine, I put sort of, I suppose that was the album, really. I usually try and put something that brings you in, but not too much, but just sort of medium. And that's what this is. It's called Going Down on Love. Got to get down. listening to uh, John Lennon's new LP. And that was Going Down on Love, and uh, you just go down in the microphone now. Okay, that was Going Down on Love with Arthur Jenkins on his beautiful conga. He's the percussionist on the album. And the song really speaks for itself, so I can't describe it. And we'd like to play another cut here, which is an instrumental which ended up on the B-side of the single. He says, like, he's on AM. <laughs> it's called Beef Jerky. And uh, I get off on this because I don't have to hear my voice all the time. Uh, there we are. We're back. There we are. There now, we you, are. you've got to rap a bit while I... Okay, so uh, let's think here. about it. So that was an instrumental. That I just had the lick, and the thing is I couldn't... Whenever I played the lick on my guitar... Uh, what's that? Number one dream. Number nine dream. Oh, yeah, nine, yeah, nine, that's I fine. That. Whenever I played the lick on the guitar, I couldn't sing it and play it at the same time, so I never got any lyrics for it, so it ended up as instrumental. And I'm rather glad of it, really. Next one's a song called Number Nine Dream, for no reason at all. Well, you've numbered things a lot over the years, huh? Uh, yeah, Number Nine seems to crop up in my life. Even the cover of the album, I used a picture of a f that I drew when I was a kid of 12, and it's a football picture, and the big, the main guy's got Number Nine on his back, so that's my number. Oh, your birthday's October the 9th. October the 9th, we had Revolution Number Nine, Number Nine, Number Nine, so let's go. This is Tom Donahue. I'm going to do it till midnight tonight. John Lennon is our guest, and we're playing cuts from his new LP, and it's, uh... It's all right. Walls and Bridges? That's right, that's right. I know. Tell us about that. Yeah, I'm always curious to know why what? people call an album what they call it. Oh, yeah. Well, normally I don't... I try not to think about the title until the end, you know? Yeah. And, as usual, I didn't. I didn't have a title, and I'd heard, I think I heard it on a public service announcement. You know, one of those brotherhood or uh -huh. late night stuff, yeah, you know, right. when they make you miserable in between the movies. <laughs> <laughs> it just, I just heard somebody flash something about Walls and Bridges. And it stayed with me. I almost called Number Nine Dream Walls and Bridges. But uh, it didn't make sense. I, it was one of those, I liked the title. I kept trying to fit it into something. I figure that it's never legitimate to ask a songwriter what a song means, but a title's a little different. Yeah, you know? title. Well, it was, I liked the thing, you know. 
walls and bridges, like walls you bump into or they close you in and bridges you go across or something like that. And it was just putting it somewhere. Put, oh, putting it somewhere. There we go. Right. <laughs> putting it to them. So I finally put it on the album. Nothing else came. You know, I stick with the title until something better comes. And it seemed, And as the album finished, it, it seemed to be a, like, you know, without any thought what it was about. Oh, some kind of communication problem, you know? <laughs> so oh, it, it fit Can you remember what nice. we set up? Nice. Uh, uh, from the album? Oh, yeah. ain't, oh. What you got? You were prompted on. I just wanted to see it. Because I forget a lot, you know. Yeah, well, I wasn't sure if we were going to play Angel Baby. Yeah, we're we're going to get to Angel Baby. Yeah. yeah. One. What you got? What you got? What yeah, you got? I like that a lot. Thank you. I like and, it, And uh, there's a new John Lennon album. You, I guess you got to like it all. I mean, do you do more than you put on the album? Are there the songs that you left off? Or you no, usually, I ha on this album, there's 11, which is odd. I usually have 10 on, meaning not for any reason other than if you go over about 18, 19, 20 minutes, it gets a bit low. So I, I just left one off this time. But usually, I only have exactly what I'm doing. Uh -huh. But most, there's usually one that I don't put on. Well, we were talking about uh, old records you liked, and Angel oh, yeah. Baby was one of the first ones that came to mind. That's one of my all-time favorites. I was trying to think what year Angel Baby would be. I have no idea. <laughs> I'm getting too old to remember. 62? I don't know. It sounds earlier than that. It's a pity we haven't got the B-side, because the B-side's one of the classic all-time funny records where they get it wrong. It's not even the girl singing. It's uh, obviously somebody else singing. They must have had five minutes to cut the B-side, and they, <laughs> the, the drummer's on the on beat all through it sax solo comes in too soon so there's a big hole the guitarist comes in it's the funniest record but angel baby is a beauty yeah, it's one of the great bad records it's a special category of records the b-side of angel baby is one of the all-time great bad records uh, yeah. i think angel baby is too oh no oh, i couldn't don't, i mean don't say anything but like i say that, bad don't. in the sense of bad it's yeah, bad bad you mean yeah. bad 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 like, bad, like right. bad bad yeah and it's sometimes a, bad too sometimes bad yeah. i just want to i love it so much That's Angel Baby, ah, we and uh, yeah, we're back. And I want to turn you on to one yes. we're discussing that I think is in much the same uh, space as freaks say. Um, it's by a fellow named Ron Holden. It's called I Love You So. I'm writing out a list of oldies here, you know. Uh, you were talking earlier about um, Brontosaurus Stomp, Roy oh, Wood, yeah. 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 Hello, I'm just pulling the mic near yeah. because I'm mumbling. So talk a bit about Roy, because uh, I think to a lot of people here, who just, they're just getting to know yeah. They know him through ELO, you know. And well, yeah, because he was the, he split. They they were originally Roy Wood and uh, what what's the guy in ELO? Um, Jeff Lynn. Jeff Lynn. They were in a group called The Move. I think in fact they still make records under The Move, mm -hmm. and they were sort of okay as The Move. You know, they made a lot of top ten records, <clears throat> and then they split. Uh, I don't know when, in the 60s, late 60s, they split. They, had, they just had a single hit after single Group hit. Group split up. Yeah, 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 sort of hollies but better, you know? Uh. Funkier. And then, uh, yeah, they do split up. It's amazing, yeah. isn't it? Mm -hmm. Strange. And they make good records. Now, Roy Wood uh, turned out some good stuff, and this is one of them. I know he did stuff before it, but this is the one I remember because it's the first time I saw him on TV looking like a madman with paint all, you know, striped on his face. And the only people who were doing that were real underground people then. He come on top of the pops, the English <laughs> BBC, and I just looked like a freak singing this song. I liked it. And I like uh, the other ELO too. We'll get to them later. Okay, let's get back to work. Uh, with ELO. Right, which is yeah. the next progression of Roy Wood, right? Right, that was, this is Jeff Lynn. This is a few years later. And uh, I think they once said they were taken off where the Beatles left off with Walrus, and I think this is a good result of it. As somebody here was saying, that's another one that was uh, stolen from the Beatles, in a sense. Or no, borrowed, how's that? No, it, I wouldn't call it stealing. There's a little, little movements here, you know, mm -hmm. that you can... Uh, almost pick which songs but uh, you can do that with Beatle music too if you know where our influences came from you know and uh, what was it on the uh, showdown one um, we won't name which where the pieces came from because somebody might pick it up and sue them you know but <laughs> there's two records there but it's beautifully done oh, no, and it's improved it? I mean, yeah well it's uh, grapevine. grapevine and uh, thunder and uh, what is it? lightning strikes again oh. Lou Christie but 
you could never place it. You know, if you wrote it out, it would look nothing the same if you wrote music. This is Tom Donahue, and John Lennon is our guest tonight, and we've been... Well, he started off playing uh, things from his new LP, and then uh, took a turn somewhere down the road and got into some favorite records of his. We'll get back to that, but I thought it might be nice, since he is in town, to go back to Walls and Bridges. That would be nice, yes. Yeah. We almost forgot about it, didn't we? Yeah, for a moment. We've got a pile of records here I've been ordering up. Uh, yeah, we're going to play a uh, track two, side two, called Surprise, Surprise. And, yeah, believe it or not, when I first started writing this, it sounded like, little darling, do-do-do-do-do-do. But listen, and you'll hear it's nowhere near it. <laughs> That, just because uh, I must mention, that was Elton John singing harmony on that record. And they almost lost him on the mix, but it's there. <laughs> on earphones, you really get it. How about the album that uh, Spectre came in after you'd finished and worked on? Uh, oh, was that thought, the Beatles one? Right. Mm -hmm. Was there any thought about putting out the original version before he sweetened it? Well, until you mentioned it, I'd even forgotten there might be one. I don't think we ever mixed it ourselves. Uh -huh. Because by then, we hated it so much. And I think, A, the, the, the tracks, some of the tracks are pretty rough because we weren't, we weren't cooking at all and uh, nobody could face playing it or mixing it and going in. Nobody wanted to do it, nobody had an yeah. interest in it. And when you go back now and I suppose you have to from time to time listen to the things you did with the Beatles. Oh, I, I like listening. You like, yeah. um, I mean, are there things that have gotten better to you over the years that you look back on and think, oh, but that was dynamite. Some have well, gotten be better in as much as I thought uh, I didn't like them at the time, you know, because I wanted it to be something else. You know, you often go in with a sound in mind and come out with some... You know, you go in, you, you want to be B.B. King or whatever, right? Uh. And you come out and you're not. And for years that hangs with you, what you were trying to do. And then I hear it and think, oh, that's okay. I wasn't as bad as I thought. And where were we? Um, well, <laughs> we're back on an album called oh, we're Walls in San Francisco, and Bridges. Yeah. Hi, right. hi. Did you do the drawings? No, this is the first uh, cover of an album that I, I didn't do myself. Because I like doing them, I like even pasting them together. But I was really uh, too cooking on the album to even think about it. So I let the guy at Capitol do it, Roy Kahara, and he turned out a nice job. Actually, it was originally going to be the cover for the Spectre album, which we keep going back to. Uh -huh. but, but, but you will be going back to it. Right? Yeah, I go, when I leave here, I'll go back to it, back to New York. And uh, so we used it for this instead, and it works the same. Are okay, we now we're, we're back to side two. Uh -huh. No, it, I'm sorry, it's side one. You side one, this, this is... Uh, Bless you. Bless you. You can dance very slowly to it. Well, I enjoyed dancing with you, Tom. It's... It is delightful. We could be on Come Dancing if they just brought it back. Yeah, and we could trade it with you for Lawrence Welk. Right. I've always thought they would go together incredibly well. Come Dancing is a BBC show. And it, um, it's a program that is devoted to various clubs around England that do ballroom dancing. And they dance competitively on this TV show. And uh, they each have their own compare to sort of talk up how... Uh, Mary's know. wearing 4,000 sequins hand-sewn to the back of her neck. By Roy. Yes, right, right. right. He's a mechanic during the daytime. And this is the last night they'll be dancing together because Mary's engaged and her fiancé doesn't dance. <laughs> <laughs> and the great military dancers, I always love them, when a whole lot of people are, are uh, teams of... Oh, they do the sort of you know, the like team formation dancing, yeah, right. they call it. Oh, yeah, that's the big yeah. trip. Couples ten over people 70 all playing. men balls, right? Now. Yeah, right, all doing the tango. The men like doing them Spanish ones, you know? Yeah. Where they can put their hands up and hold their guts in. A, I always thought it was that and uh, Monty Python. Yeah, they were the two funniest programs. <laughs> They're bringing that show over here yeah. uh, on cable. Of, what do you call it here? Public, what is it? Public well, TV. Or public TV. And National Educational. National Educational, you call it, yeah. The, uh, that's coming shortly, so. I hope you're around to see it, man. Uh, yeah, I might even introduce it. They asked me to. But How are things going about staying in the country? Well, you know, every now and then they give me 30 days to get out, which is what, you know, and then we appeal it. Mm -hmm. And taxi drivers say, oh, you're still here? <laughs> <laughs> so it goes on like that. Uh, 
Okay, let's get to the uh, album you did with Harry Nielsen. Yeah, well, this is the first take we did, and uh, it was in Record Plant West, and it was the first night, and you can tell. Well, let, let, let me ask you this, though, first. How did you happen to get with Harry on it? Because he's had... Um, I know you've known him for a long time. And he uh, often I, I wasn't hanging around with him, but Ringo was a lot. Uh -huh. I, I met and him Derek. years ago through Derek, yeah. Right. Derek produced an album. So I really didn't get to know him till this album. I think that's uh, one of the cuts in the album that, that people really enjoy hearing the most. Of. Yeah, I like it because it's sort of, you know, mad. Oh, yeah, totally. It's, it's really mad, yeah. <laughs> a lot of edits in it, which I still hear. Spot the edit, folks, and you win an invisible <laughs> T-shirt. And he did some things, uh, I guess, <clears throat> I have in mind the ending of Many Rivers to Cross that sounded... Uh, that was second night. Right. Second or third. Sounded like you've been listening to your albums. No. Oh, well, he, I, he, no doubt he's heard them. But he was singing it pretty much as he sang it, but he was holding back. So I just said, you know, because he really, it was him brought the song to me. I think a good and I, I loved it, yeah. and I just kept asking him for more on it. Yeah. And he, he it turned out like it did, and I, I liked it. I knew there was going to be, oh, it sounds like he's doing John. But there's a certain point when you get high, right, either singing or anyway, where you're going to go to the same place. Mm -hmm. There was nowhere else for him to go but there. I think it's a tremendous voice. Yeah, I love it. Uh, I think the, uh, I'm trying to think of the song that Richard Berry did with him. That, uh, oh, Without You. Without You. Oh. Yeah. You know, just That's another. Record, yeah. I love it. I just heard that uh, they cut the piano and the vocal first and then laid everything else on it after. Amazing. I've never done that. Here's a Dylan song that uh, you wanted to play. Oh, yeah, Karina, Karina. This is one of the early Dylan records I got turned on to. And I like this one. You know? And uh, he didn't write it or nothing. And when I met him and he was saying, you know, we were swapping shit and that, I said, I like Karina, Karina. You know, it's nice backing. And he looked at me like surprise, you know, back in. You know. I said, oh, yeah, the back in is great. <laughs> so let's hear it. Karina, Karina. Bob Dylan's Karina. And uh, you said you heard that in Paris the first time? Yeah, I think that was the first time I ever heard him at all. And I think Paul got the record from a French DJ. Uh, oh, we were doing a. Uh, radio thing there and the guy had the record in the studio and paul said oh i keep hearing about this guy or he'd heard it i'm not sure and we took it back to the hotel and fell in love like mm -hmm. just to jump off him for a minute before we get on to some commercials mm -hmm. and some other things um do you have any desire to uh, appear live again i mean does that turn you on would you like to try i get again? the uh, buzz to do it now and then but i always get uh, like I project and see it all. You know, I tend to do that about everything, you know, even yeah. going downstairs or putting my trousers on. That's good. But then, uh, mm, right. <laughs> so sometimes I feel already done it. And then you think about the, the percent of good shows one has out of, say, you're lucky to get three out of ten where you really hit the moments that you're looking for. This is Tom Donahue and. Uh John Lennon's our guest tonight. We've been playing cuts from his new LP, and we'll be getting back to that. And uh, right now we're just playing some records he likes, and we're up to the Whalers. Yeah. Uh, I've forgotten who turned me on to the Whalers. I think it was Gary Kelgren from Record Plant yeah. West. And he played it to me at a party. And it blew me head off like. It's very good. Eric got I Shot the Sherry from the album. That's one of their tracks. This is the track I like best. I get up. Get up. We really knocked that one around. I mean, at least I... It might work anyway. Yeah, it could. I played the song at the right speed. Ah, yeah, this afternoon yeah. you played it. Yeah. Well, the guy playing sax there, Bobby Keys, he heard it on the radio, and he said, "Oh, that's a nice sax solo. Not here, in L.A. Yeah. <laughs> and then at the end of it, they said, well, he, he realized it was him playing it. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? Uh, what we were actually trying to do, though, was go from Scared. Scared into Dancing really with Mr. D. Into Dancing with Mr. D. Yeah, and we didn't. Cause so we, if you'll just move uh, whatever gets you through the night in front of Scared, 
I was scared with yeah. a track from the album, which we didn't say what, what it was. Right. Remember, we went yeah. in from the wolves. That was the track, yeah. <laughs> and it was supposed to go to this. <laughs> ah, it's just a wonderful fantasy just popped in the room. Yeah. And it was the idea of uh, Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys and uh, Phil. Phil Spector producing Harry Nielsen. Yeah, what a Incredible. scene. Incredible. Mm. I'd love to see it. Yeah. I'll film it. <laughs> yeah, really. But What's the most expensive record. album the Beatles ever made, would you say? Sergeant Pepper, because it took nine months. It wasn't nine months in the studio, but we'd, we'd work, then stop a bit, work it out, rest, work. It was the most expensive, and of course the record company was screaming. They screamed at the price of the cover, etc., etc. And now it's probably pinned all over the walls. <laughs> How many tracks was that? I don't remember. I think it's four tracks. Yeah. Oh, I see that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah. I thought you meant how many tracks on the album. No. Uh, I don't. I don't remember. I. Th um, I don't remember it being four. I know they keep telling us we worked on four, so we must have. I remember we were always waiting for something, and uh, I thought by now I keep thinking it must have been 16 tracks, but I think you were right. But it was four or eight is the answer to that one. <laughs> uh, with Nielsen, you're working with 16, right? Oh, sure, yeah. And it's been 16 for a long time. A duck phone. Well, the, the, you oh, duck phone, there's a nice story about that. You get more than 16 that. now. Oh, I know that. I could, I, I've never gone over 16. I mean, I've u used tracks, you know, mixed down and mixed together to get more available. But that 24 business and 38, you know, couldn't deal with it. Back to music. You know that I, somebody told me a story about this song, which is the Doc Pomus who is in a wheelchair, who lives in a wheelchair. I only met him once, I was thrilled. And he wrote this for his beautiful wife. And it's Save the Last Dance for me. And it's Harry singing. A couple of incredible records. The uh, yeah. John Lennon produced Harry Nielsen version of uh, Save the Last Dance for Me and then the Drifters doing the original. And the uh, yeah. album that you worked out with Phil is oldies, isn't it? Yeah, uh, it's all oldies. Uh, what did we do? What did we do? Oh, I don't want to say what we did because people cover them. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's 73 we started, if it ever comes out. Well, you see, it's safer than Oldie's album because you don't need to feel rushed. That it'll, that's true, that's it, true. It isn't going to lose that thing of being of the moment, you know. This is Tom Donahue. We're talking to uh, John Lennon, and uh, I thought it was about time we got back to what he used to do and played some Beatles things. Yeah, I'm still doing the same on you. I know a bit more about it, I guess. I'm going to use something from the White Album, right? Yeah, now? let's... Uh, the chocolate box. Go for a bit of that. I'm so tired. Written in the hills of Himalayas. Oh. Hmm. That's one thing transcendental meditation does for you. It's make you so tired. Any reason you, you sleep. went to that one? Uh... Because uh, that was the first one when, when we said, oh, White Album. That was the one that came to mind, mm -hmm. just like that. I know the uh, Beatle experts in the world full of them uh, always point to revolver as the big turning point i think there's a lot of people around are rock and roll critics today that that may be the first thing they ever heard well uh like everything people go in trends you know and the trend now is to think that was the change and the trend before was to think rubber soul was the change and then the other trend was sergeant pepper right but the whole thing was a gradual change, so there was no major... You weren't conscious of being spun around or anything? Uh, no, but we were conscious that the, uh, some formula or something was... It was moving ahead, that was for sure. But we were on the road, you know? Not physically. I mean, uh, on the road in the studio. And the weather was clear. I think it was your son suggested going uh, out the blue from the Mind Games album to Sexy Sadie or vice versa, doesn't it? Because the chords are similar. It'd be interesting to hear me uh, pinching myself. Right. This is Tom Donahue. Our guest is John Lennon of the Blue. Well, 
That sets us on a trip talking, right? Yeah. yeah it's easy to drift away doing this. Yeah. Like this. Well, especially when I was there, you know? Mm. Mm. Amazing. Do you find the specific memories coming back on oh, the yeah. songs? Yeah. I remember you know, singing them mm -hmm. and writing them. It's always two separate places. That was written in India, too. Just as we were leaving, waiting for our bags to be packed in the taxi that never seemed to come, we thought. They're <laughs> deliberately keeping the taxi back so that we can't escape from this madman's camp. <laughs> we had a mad Greek with us that was paranoid as hell, kept saying, it's black magic, black magic, they're going to keep you here forever. So that was what I was doing while that was going on. Uh, but you got away. I must have got away, because I'm here. Yeah, you're here. And uh, what well, you say a little while ago? You said, like the way that what meditation done to your voice? Well, I, whether it was meditation or being away from everything, I mean, we were really away from everything. It was like a sort of recluse holiday camp, you know, right at the foot of the Himalayas. It was like being up a mountain, but they call it the foothills, hanging over the Ganges with uh, baboons stealing your breakfast and everybody flowing around in robes and sitting in the rooms for hours and hours meditating. It was quite a trip, you know. I was in a room for five days meditating once. That was quite a trip. I wrote hundreds of songs. Couldn't sleep and <laughs> I was hallucinating like crazy. Songs, having dreams meditating. where you could yeah. smell. Uh, now I'd do a few hours and then you'd trip off, you know, uh, or half or whatever you're supposed to be doing, you know, three or four hour stretches and you'd really trip out. You know. And it was just like a, a way of getting there. And you'd go, amazing trips. But it's, it, was, it was never the bit where you, when you got back to, you know, cooking and living daily in the, in the uh, Western world, like, you know, getting up for breakfast and going to work or making records or back to so-called reality. You just can't fit it in. Well... Well, John, thank you very much for coming up. It's been a pleasure. It was a pleasure, Tom. I really enjoyed it. And... Uh, yeah, we really got down to the, uh, the long trip down to the old uh, road, which right. is the last track we're going to play. Then. And you got a gig here anytime you want it. Thank you. Uh, I'll be back. I enjoyed yeah. it. We'll be expecting you, believe me.